Though the lives of adult mayflies are quick and fleeting, they are anything but subtle. Keep your mouth closed and follow me into the swarm. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we're talking about the order Ephemeroptera, better known as the mayflies. So in our last episode, I talked about the snakeflies and just how ancient they are, originating around 150 to 200 million years ago. Well, mayflies have them beat. The oldest known full-body fossil of a flying insect is believed to have been an ancient mayfly from 300 million years ago. For reference, dinosaurs appeared around 50 million years after that. Fun fact, the man who found the fossil did so in a swamp behind a Massachusetts strip mall. Adventures out there. So in case you come across any parking lot fossils, let's talk about how you identify a mayfly. Mayflies are paleopterous, or ancient wings, which means they can't fold their wings over their abdomen. The only living examples of this are the mayflies and then the dragonflies and damselflies. This is as opposed to Neopterous or new-winged insects, such as beetles and everything else. Yes, I know many butterflies can't fold their wings over their abdomens, but this is believed to be a secondary loss, where a trait is evolved and then reverted later in its evolution. Because mayflies are Paleopterous, their wings are going to be sticking straight up into the air. Also, their forewings are going to be sort of triangular and significantly larger than their hindwings. Aside from that, mayflies are going to have cylindrical bodies ending in two to three long filaments called cerci. Okay, well, two of them are cerci. If they do have a third one, that's going to be a median caudal filament. Reminiscent of their dragonfly cousins, mayflies are going to have larger eyes and shorter antennae primarily relying on vision to navigate their environment. The males of some mayfly families will even have an additional set of compound eyes on top of their head. That way they can spot females from below. Speaking of mating, the mayfly life cycle is pretty odd. Okay, so in past videos I've described holometaboly and hemimetaboly. Holometaboly is a complete four-stage metamorphosis from egg, to larvae, to pupae, to adult. Hemimetaboly is an incomplete three-stage metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. The main difference is that hemimetabolous insects lack a pupal stage. However, one rule remains consistent across both of these life cycles, and that's that the immatures don't have wings. If an insect does have wings, it only receives those wings after molting into its final, reproductively mature adult stage, called an imago. Mayflies are the only living order to break this rule. Mayflies have what is called a sub-imago stage, which is a stage between nymph and adult where they have wings, but they're not yet reproductively mature. However, their overall life cycle is still considered to be hemimetabolous. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, let's go a little bit deeper on what a mayfly life cycle actually looks like. Each female mayfly lays hundreds or even thousands of eggs into lakes or streams or other water bodies, as their nymphs are aquatic. Oftentimes, females will do this by dipping their abdomen repeatedly into the water as they fly over the surface laying a batch of eggs each time. Other times, they'll land and they'll lay eggs on the water or even submerge themselves, laying batches of eggs in safe places under the surface, often drowning in the process. Once the eggs hatch, the mayfly naiads will graze their environment for algae and pieces of organic debris, although there are cases of predatory mayfly nymphs. Quick side note, if a hemimetabolous insect has an aquatic nymphal stage, you'll often hear them referred to as naiads. It just means aquatic nymph, so don't worry too much about it. Mayfly naiads are somewhat flattened, and like the adults, they have two or normally three filaments coming off the end of their abdomen. You should also be able to see gills lining the abdomen on the sides or bottom. 
The naiads will usually need around a year or more to fully develop, but this can vary based on water temperature and other environmental conditions. When they're ready to move on from their aquatic upbringing, the naiads will molt into their sub-imago stage. Sometimes this occurs under the water and the sub-imago bursts from the water surface. Other times the naiads will crawl out of the water and then molt into their sub-imago stage. The sub-imago stage is usually brief, lasting only a day or two before molting into their final adult form. Once an adult, mayflies only live a couple of days. They don't even have functional mouths. They're really just there to mate and lay eggs. But they like to make a spectacle of it. Many mayflies use a strategy called predator satiation. This is where they sync up their emergence as adults to be in such large numbers that predators can eat as much as they want and still not really affect their population. It's the same kind of concept as those mass emergences of periodical cicadas. Mayflies use environmental cues to determine their emergence as adults, such as water temperature and flow. And this is why they're all able to sync up with one another. Safety in numbers. After mating, the females will lay their eggs and restart the cycle. Ephemeropterans actually get their name from this intense yet brief mating display. Ephemera means short-lived, and pteron means wing. So Ephemeroptera means short-lived with wings. We just like to throw Terra on the end of most of our winged orders, I guess. Mayflies likely get their common name from their emergence in the warmer months, but they're definitely not limited to just May. Temperature willing, you can see them all through spring, summer, and even fall. Though the mass emergences might be a nuisance to some, mayflies are a critical part of our aquatic and terrestrial food webs. And these mass emergences can be a much needed feeding frenzy for fish, birds, rodents, and more. Many anglers will even use lures to mimic mayflies at all stages of life, from nymph to subimago to adult. You'll hear them call the subimago a dun and the imago a spinner. The name spinner refers to when adult mayflies fall onto the water surface exhausted post mating, a perfect treat for fish. And consequently, a great pattern to imitate when trying to lure in a bite. Mayflies are also very important bioindicators for water quality. Invertebrate abundance and diversity is a great way to assess the health of an aquatic system. You'll often hear the term EPT thrown around. This stands for Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. These three orders are very pollution intolerant, so paying attention to their abundance and diversity ratings can give a lot of information about water quality. Consequently, one of the reasons for Ephemeroptera decline is chemical runoff. Pesticides and fertilizers leaching into our waterways can greatly affect water quality. And while a lot of this is due to large-scale agriculture and industrial processes, there are some things we can do on a smaller scale to help. Outside of advocating for better environmental law, if you have water on your property, take steps to maximize your ecologic benefit. Minimizing chemical usage on your property is a great start, but also planting and encouraging native plant growth around your waterways can help filter runoff, stabilize soil, and temperature regulate the water through shading. Light pollution is another big factor. Lights at night can confuse mayflies on where to lay their eggs, mistaking light bouncing off of asphalt and other glossy surfaces for water and laying their eggs directly onto the land. Turning off your outdoor light at night is a great help, and advocating for better light pollution ordinances in your area can have an even greater impact. Visit darksky.org for more info on that. So despite their large emergences, mayflies can still be at risk. The downside of predator satiation is that it only works in massive numbers. Mayfly abundance is decreasing, and if it continues to do so, they could reach a point where their mass emergence isn't enough to satiate predators without large blows to their population. This incredible group has stuck around for hundreds of millions of years, and it'd be a shame for them to go sideways on our account. Thank you so much for listening, and if you enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. And if you have any favorite species from this group or any fun Ephemeroptera facts I didn't cover, please leave them in the comments below. I would love to hear about them. Peace, y'all.